Welcome to the three amigos, they decided to call this. It's a, it's a comparison and contrast of the three interpretive biographies of Jesus that we call Matthew, Mark, Luke. And today is the overview. Next week we'll delve into Mark. I have half a dozen preliminary observations. The first one is, this is my fancy email address. It's in the, the church directory. Feel free to use it this week. We can have our own Q&A. You can educate me. Third preliminary remark, the format for this series. Lecture is an efficient way to package information. It is not for many people the most efficient way to assimilate information. So with your indulgence, I'm going to run on two tracks. I have about a half hour presentation and I'll chug the train down that track and stop in time for us to, for me to shut up and for you to talk. How's that sound? Fourth preliminary point. I plan to share with you some items that where scholars have reached tentative consensus on the three Gospels. I'm not a great scholar, but I've been studying and teaching these books for over half a century, so I think you can trust me. Fifth preliminary point. I'm going to have some surprises for you and some of them may be disturbing, and that's okay. Last Sunday in this room, Bishop Rob said, many Christians have an immature faith. Well, I would put the point slightly differently. I would say we have a serious chasm between what people in the pews know and what scholars in the seminaries and universities know. It's a serious problem, and I'm not sure what to do about it. A lot of the things that are taken for granted in the world of scholarship would strike many lay people as, as shocking, maybe even unchristian. But I've discovered that Bartians are remarkably well-educated and open and curious, so I'm not too worried about smelling like a bonfire after today. And a sixth preliminary point, get my all, all this fancy technology working. We're going to see a lot of contrast, so please keep in mind that that no matter how much they argue with each other, Matthew, Mark, and Luke agree on a portrait of Jesus that has these traits. He's a wonderful model of moral integrity, compassion, loving God by caring for God's creation, uh, how to imagine God and realize the kingdom of God on earth. It's all in there, in all three gospels. They coincide on that. All right? We can put it in Latin, or we can put it on a plain bumper sticker, but WWJD is a far better watchword to live our lives by than the familiar human pattern of riding roughshod over everything and everybody to amass the most toys before we die. The synoptic gospels, we call them that because they send optic see the Jesus story more or less in the same way. John is different. The synoptics are in this universe, and John's over here. I was going to include John in the series and just didn't have time. So, so uh, if the second coming is delayed, we will get around to John. I have to figure it out first. <laughs> we, we think the synoptics don't just cluster in viewpoint, but also in time. For example, we are pretty confident, I'll explain why next week, in dating Mark right around 70, 70 CE or AD. That was the year when the first Jewish war with Rome ended. Well, Masada, the desert fortress, fell in 73. But Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed in 70. And we think Mark was writing either just at the end of the war or right after it. We think that Matthew and Luke were written around 80 to 85, which means they were more or less contemporary and we don't think they knew each other. Luke actually may be a couple of years later. On the other hand, John, we usually date around 90 to 95, but I've noticed in recent scholarship they're pushing it into the early second century. All right? It's not clear if John knew the three earlier Gospels, even, if they, even though they were earlier, but they didn't have the internet around. We know that the uh, synoptics are related in some curious ways. You've probably seen this sketch or something like it. 
in the 19th century, scholars came up with what they called the two sources hypothesis. They said Matthew and Luke drew heavily on Mark and on a written gospel we no longer have that we call Q from the German Cavella source. We don't have this source. It was strangely a, it was a curious gospel. Apparently, it had no narrative parts. It was just a, a Bartlett's. It was a list of familiar quotations, Logia from Logos, Jesus sayings. Uh, there are passages in Mark and Luke that run word for word in the Greek. But as I said, we think they didn't know each other. Thus, the necessity for Q. In the 19th century, many scholars were skeptical of the theory because, as I say, we don't have it. Good, good objection. And then, as you know, in 1945 at Nag Hammadi in Egypt, we dug up the famous so-called Gnostic Gospels. And there was the Gospel of Thomas, 114 Jesus sayings. And scholars said, oh, well, if there was a Gospel of Thomas, maybe there was a Gospel of you. And then in 1924, B.H. Streeter refined it into the Four Sources Hypothesis. Scholars are never satisfied with simplicity. You notice Matthew has a green stripe. Luke has, I guess that's teal. We now think that in addition to Mark and Q, Matthew had written or oral sources within his own community. M, the green. And we think that the same thing was true of Luke. So L, Four Sources. Mark, Q, M, L. All right? Scholarship, I said a moment ago I would share some areas where we have tentative consensus. I have to word it that way because, as you know, in any field, scholarship is always a moving target. It's a matter of provisional knowledge. And, um, and it usually moves very slowly meticulously building on what has gone before. But sometimes we have abrupt upheavals, what Thomas Kuhn taught us all to call paradigm shifts, right? If you think about Darwin's origin of species in 1859, what that did to the field of biology, or I mentioned a moment ago the, the Gnostic Gospels. The Gnostic Gospels, over the next oh, three decades, revolutionized what we had thought about early Christianity. In fact, scholars now are talking about early Christianities. What the Gnostic got, they, they're not that important in themselves. We looked at about 24 of them in this room last year, right? Took us four, four sessions. They may not be that important in themselves, but, but they help to make us realize just how diverse early Christianity was, and just how successfully the emerging proto-Orthodox church stamped out all that variety. Uh, we know now that the proto-Orthodox party triumphed because they had a wonderful strategy of clergy, creed, and canon. My lecture last year on the three C's is still available on the YouTube channel, so I'll just refer you to that. I could and should have mentioned the 4C, of course. It wasn't part of the plan, but it made a huge difference. When Constantine decided to reverse the pattern of emperors not liking Christianity and threw the emperor's support behind the bishops of the emerging proto-Orthodox church, well, that was pretty big. That was pretty big. Const uh, paradigm shifts are always controversial at first. And I'm talking about Constantine. This particular paradigm shift that we call Nicaea, uh, it was horribly controversial even among members of the Proto-Orthodox party. Next time you're saying it in, in church, think about that. Uh, it took things like, like Chalcedon in 451, Constantinople II in 553, before it became established. Nicaea was 325, 553, yes. Proto-Orthodox Christians fought for over two centuries before they gathered around the flag. Interesting. And the party line claimed that the Proto-Orthodox, the Nicene Church, had the one true story about Jesus, which had been believed everywhere, always by everyone. It was a lie, of course. <laughs> 
But if you tell a lie often enough and insistently enough, you take a lot of people along with you. The Democratic server was not in, no, we won't go there. <laughs> Here's a good question. If the church wanted one story about Jesus, why did they canonize four biographies that were bound to disagree? Huh. Well, Eusebius had the answer. He said, the earth has four corners, north, south, east, west. We had to have four. <laughs> now, the real answer was plain, as it so often is, politics. There were some proto-Orthodox groups that had to be mollified. And, for instance, the Pauline Christians insisted on Luke. The Johannine Christians insisted on John. So, there you have it, politics. Um, it even extended to the names that the church gave our canonical gospels. We know now that they all four are anonymous. But the church wanted them to be written by eyewitnesses or eyewitnesses of the eyewitnesses because that way presumably they would carry more authority. So the church decided that Matthew was, yes, one of the twelve. He was the tax collector, although Mark and Luke called him Levi. They decided that Mark, okay, he was not himself one of the twelve, but he was the private secretary to Simon Peter, close enough. They decided that Luke was the companion of Paul, who in his letters, you remember, is always at pains to assert that his authority is at least equal to that of the pillars. And then John, well, he was one of the twelve. He was the son of Zebedee. He was the beloved disciple. All right? Just think for a moment about this. Why would an eyewitness like Matthew depend so heavily on Mark, who wasn't even there? Not very logical. But anyway, this political process I'm describing extended even, even to what the church did in ordering the canon. Why did the church give priority of place to Matthew, first of the four Gospels, first book in the entire New Testament? Part of the reason was that only Matthew of the Gospels actually uses the word church, ecclesia, three times. The church made the canon Matthew praises the church. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But the story gets even more interesting because the books that the church canonized sometimes contain things that were heretical. Don't try this on your neighbor who's a Southern Baptist. <laughs> or do. Um, I, I have to do a quick digression for you. In the early church, Christians fought with each other viciously over the nature of Christ. Some said, some said that he was 100% God. He just appeared to be human, the Docetists. Some said he was 100% human. Some said he was, you know, 50-50, 60-40. Some said he wasn't either, he was an angel. And many early Christians, probably, you ready, probably all of the very earliest followers of Jesus started out as adoptionists. Jesus was human and then something happened. The adoptionists thought that God had selected Jesus, had adopted him as special Messiah, as special son. And, um, and the church later decided that adoptionism was a heresy. You remember the prologue to the Gospel of John. But by that point, these books were, were already pretty well established in the canon, so the church was stuck. <laughs> Quick digression. Mashiach, our word for Messiah, the Greek word Christos, simply means anointed. And it refers to that quaint tradition of taking your olive flask and pouring some olive oil over a thing or later a person. Uh, meaning, God has selected this place, this thing, this person for some special purpose. And there are many messiahs running around the Hebrew Bible. 
every individual Israelite male. Sorry, ladies. Corporate Israel, the kings of Israel, even Cyrus, the pagan king, God adopted him, anointed him to enable them to come back from exile. Uh, there's a synonym in the Hebrew Bible. Messiahs were also often called sons of God. And there are lots of those running around the Hebrew Bible. Um, even the angels are called sons of God. But notice something interesting. None of these Jewish messiahs or sons of God was divine. These were human beings that God had anointed, had adopted for some purpose. Our notion of son of God is part of the, part of the, the Trinity. Nicaea was 250 years in the future. Words change meaning over time. And what's worse is that our convention is to capitalize words like Holy Spirit, Son of God in our Bible translations. The Greek did not have that distinction between lowercase and capital. And can you imagine how many bonfires there would be if, if some modern translation came out that did not capitalize Son of God or Holy Spirit? <laughs> okay, so that's the end of the digression. Now here's the shocker. We think that Paul was an adoptionist. He was a heretic. So was Mark. So was Luke. This is the first sentence in Romans. It is a monstrosity. I wish I could have taught English to Paul. This thing, it's a marathon that goes forever. So what I did was to bold the key words for you. Paul says that Jesus descended from David according to the flesh. Got it? He was born the same way you or I were. And then God changed the situation. God anointed him, adopted him. When does Paul think it happened? He was declared to be son of God, Messiah, by resurrection from the dead. Scholars are always pointing that out that Paul has a resurrection Christology which helps us understand why Paul almost never says anything about the, the deeds, the life of Jesus, the teachings. Everything for Paul is death and resurrection. This is the beginning of Mark. There is no virgin birth in Mark. Mark says the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, Son of God, happened at the baptism. And he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens, ripped, uh, the heavens ripped apart and God's spirit descending like a dove on him. The revised, new revised standard version is often dead wrong. This is a bad translation. The Greek says the spirit descended into him. Mark and Luke later toned that down. It descended on him, <coughs> first on his shoulder maybe. But Mark gives you something like the opposite of demonic possession. At the baptism, God took possession of Jesus. It's really dramatic. And what's more, lest we miss the point, Mark says Jesus heard a voice. Matthew and Luke make it public. This is my beloved. But, but Mark says Jesus heard a voice that said, you are my son, son of God. And some manuscripts had the rest of the quote from, from Isaiah and Psalms. This day have I begotten you, okay? By the way, we think that was part of the coronation liturgy when someone became a king. So, the emerging church put itself in a bind. It insisted it taught the one true story about Jesus, believed everywhere, always by everyone, and then it put its approval on four different biographies that sometimes are very different and occasionally even have ideas the church later decided were heresy. So much for the unitary theory. Now, um, I want to show you something pretty cool. We have a tool that we use for studying the Gospels that we call a harmony of the Gospels. Here's uh, one example. There are many of them out there. Here's a much bigger example that was done by four German scholars, of course. <laughs> What a harmony of the gospel does, 
is march through the life of Jesus chronologically, showing what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and sometimes John say about the feeding of the 5,000 or whatever. Facing columns. And it's a misnomer. We should call it a disharmony of the Gospels because what it does is make it impossible not to notice all the differences. Uh, and these differences really bother some people. Bill Denneke tells me about his Aunt Alice who says, who says, if I can't believe everything in the Bible is true, then I can't believe any of it. Oh. Obviously, Alice defines truth as literal fact. There is no other kind of truth. But my favorite example is another fundamentalist, a guy named Harold Linzel. He was associated with right-wing outfits like Fuller or Wheaton. His big book was published in 1976 by the right-wing press launder, but it's called The Battle for the Bible. And at one point, he looks at that story about the rooster that crowed the night Peter said he didn't know Jesus, you remember? And he adds up the different crowings and the different gospels, and he comes up with, that was one busy bird. Well, <laughs> yeah, and, and even Lenzel says, wow, this is pretty hard to swallow, but we have to because the only alternative is to say the Bible lies. Can't have that. Well, most of us are not losing sleep at night about differences in the Bible. Most of us, in fact, don't even notice them. Or if we do, we shrug them off as unimportant. I've got three quick examples for you. At Calvary, Mark says that Jesus' mother watched from a long way off, right? But John puts Mary right there at the foot of the cross where Jesus can speak to her. Or two, the birth story. Matthew has wise men, stargazers at the crib. But Luke has the low end of the social totem pole. He has shepherds. So what do we do? Without even thinking about it, we harmonize the Gospels and we put both of them at our crosses. Or a third example, Mark says the public ministry of Jesus lasted at most one year. But John says it was three years because three different times Jesus takes his disciples to Jerusalem for Passover. That's a huge difference and we're not even aware of it. Uh, here's a really interesting example. How many sermons have you and I heard about the seven words from the cross? We need sayings, like you, like Thomas, uh, Logia from Logos word. Um, and we harmonize these seven sayings even though, even though they're not found in any one gospel. I just want to point something out to you. Look at number four. The famous cry of dear election, Mark says Jesus' last words were the heart-wrenching, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now look at number seven. Luke says his last words were the calm, confident, trusting, Father, into your hand I commend my spirit. There is no way to reconcile these stories. Oh, you may have heard or read that, that the quote in Mark comes from Psalm 22, and that by the end of that long psalm, the speaker has regained trust in God. That's true, but Mark quotes from the beginning, not the end. And as we will see next week, the beginning captures the bummerness, is that a word? The thumbs down tone of Mark all the way through the book. All right? Now, modern scholars are weird dudes, dudettes. They have a different approach. They do not, they do not uh, harmonize differences in scripture. They get all excited and they grab their microscopes and they ask the simple question, why? Because it leads to very interesting examples. I want to wrap up today and then I'll shut up. I want to wrap up and let you take the floor with some quick examples. The temptations. You remember we have them in two different versions, Matthew and Luke, right? Uh, and they agree on what the three temptations were, but they changed the order. I don't know if you ever noticed that. Matthew says 
Satan said, you're hungry. Turn these stones into Big Macs. Because you've got to start with physical survival. No, he's preaching philosophy to someone who's dying of starvation. And then he says, go up to the pinnacle of the temple and throw yourself off. See if the angels rescue you. And then he says, worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Luke agrees, except that after basic physical survival, Luke turns around number two and three. Why? Scholars have figured out that Matthew was a Jew writing for Jews. Nostalgia for the destroyed temple is more important than the whole world. But Luke is a Gentile writing for Gentiles. What's more, he's a universalist. He's a cosmopolitan. He's at home in the cities of the world. And so for him, yeah, the temple, this is a shame we lost it, but, but all the world? Very interesting, this difference. Um, second example, everybody knows that Jesus met a rich young ruler. No, he didn't. Mark calls him a man. Matthew calls him a rich young man. Only Luke says he was a ruler. But even more interesting is to look at the setup for these three stories. Mark says, as Jesus started on his way, we'll talk about that next week. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up and knelt before him. Good teacher, what must I do for salvation? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. Luke follows his source, Mark, almost word for word. Good teacher, why do you call me good? But look what Matthew does. People wouldn't even notice this. He simply moves the location of the adjective. Teacher, what good deed must I do to be saved? And Jesus has a totally different answer. Obey the commandments. Why, scholars ask. Because again, Matthew is a Jew. More than that, he's a very devout Jew. And for Matthew, oh, if I move good, that gives me another opportunity to hammer my constant theme, the importance of Torah. You see? Here's another example. Mark and his Jesus talk about the kingdom of God. Matthew and his Jesus call it the kingdom of heaven. And you and I say, okay, big deal, shrug it off. Uh, 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 uh. Scholars point out that Matthew was not just Jewish, he was devoutly Jewish. I used to have students from time to time at Westminster who would not write out the word God. It would be G hyphen D. Or in my New Testament classes, if they were writing about Yahweh, it would come out, we call it the sacred tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. If you have a word that lacks vowels, you cannot pronounce it. And for Jews like Matthew, they're skittish about saying the sacred name. Mark, if Mark was Jewish, he's Jewish like my Southern Baptist neighbor who loves his beer. He went all out Jewish. <laughs> all right. Another example, <coughs> the Beatitudes. Again, we have them in, Mark, uh, in Matthew and we have them in Luke. But in Matthew, Jesus says things like, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Whereas Luke just says, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the hungry. And scholars say, huh, why? And the answer is, they find that Matthew is preoccupied with the theological virtues. Things like patience or humility, being poor in spirit. Whereas Luke is the patron saint of soup kitchens and homeless shelters. Very significant difference. A final example, genealogies. Again, we have them in two different versions, Matthew and Luke. And they both trace Jesus back to David. But I also, from time to time, would have students at Westminster who would twist themselves into logical pretzels trying to reconcile these two genealogies. <laughs> um, Luke says Joseph is the son of Heli back to David by way of Nathan. But Joseph, Matthew says Joseph is the son of Jacob back to David by way of Solomon. Good luck with the logical pretzel. <laughs>
more to it than that, Matthew stops tracing Jesus' ancestry when he gets to Abraham, father of the Jews. But the universalist, the Gentile Luke, he goes all the way back to Adam, father of us all. And one more point, gematria, the SAT word for the day. Use it three times this afternoon, you'll have it forever. <laughs> gematria simply means number symbolism. Uh, a lot of people are superstitious about numbers. Think of all the elevators you've been in that didn't have a 13th floor. Uh, but gematria takes a, a, a language's alphabet and turns it into numbers. So in English, A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, that type of thing. If you do that with the Hebrew alphabet, you find that the abbreviation for David, DWD, adds up to 14. And Matthew divides Jesus' ancestry into three sets of 14. He even has to miscount on one of them. Look at it. Three, of course, the basic mnemonic aid. 14, Matthew wants to remind us, even indirectly, that Jesus is a David. He's a son of David. It's important for Matthew that Jesus is king of Israel. So, these are not literal family truths. They're it's poetry. They're making theological arguments. All right. I, uh, I think we can stop the train. Thank you for putting up with me.